Thank you, Susan, for the pass. Um, the price of it is that my talk has a somewhat grim character to it, although I promise that I will not subject you to um, graphic descriptions of physical torture. You don't need to hear that from me. Those of you who would be interested in such things with reference to Palestine, you can easily find plenty of material on the website of the Israeli Committee Against Torture. Um, so, but I do want to talk about a somewhat different kind of torture than in the Ameri essay. I have a Palestinian friend whom I will call O, for obvious reasons. Um, he didn't want his name to be revealed publicly. He was tortured by the Israeli security forces in the time-honored fashion documented by Jean Amiri. Uh, I should tell you that he was arrested, picked up along with 50 other Palestinians who were simply working at some building site. There was no real reason for the arrest or for the torture, but um, that in itself is not very unusual. In any case, when he was released, he read Amiri's essay. And he said, when I read it, I felt a little less lonely. And then he thought a moment and he said to me, I felt like I was being hugged or embraced by him, by that text. I want to cry, but I can't. But I had tears. Oh, he's an unusually reflective and articulate person, and it makes sense to me that he felt a kinship with Amiri and with his, Amiri's description of the ultimate loneliness of the tortured. In O's words, regardless of how many people outside might be praying for you, there is the feeling that you are absolutely unable to resist except by maintaining yourself together somehow. He, by the way, O, oh, wants to translate the Ameri essay into Arabic. I think it's a good idea. O's experience in the torture chambers was in no ways unusual. Something like a third of all Palestinian males in the occupied territories, so that means we're talking about at least several hundred thousand men, have been arrested by Israel. A vast number have spent time in prison, and at least in the early decades of the occupation, torture was, it seems, routine. Uh, before the landmark decision in 1999 of the Israel High, Israeli High Court of Justice banning torture in most cases. That judgment itself was one of the few real achievements of the Israeli left. Uh, in most cases, the loophole the judges left relates to what is called a ticking bomb. In other words, if there's reason to think that somebody might have information about a terrorist act that is about to take place, then with the written permission of the, um, the, pers the uh, superior officer, uh, torture uh, is still allowed. Um, I want to say just one more thing about this law. You should notice that the law, that is the ruling of the High Court of Justice, is couched in instrumental terms. If you can save lives by torture, then it's legal and maybe even ethical. Still, let me say at the outset that torture in general, and in Palestine in particular, is not, in my opinion, entirely or even primarily instrumental. That is, a way of extracting useful information. I think that instrumentality is an excuse or a rationalization. Anyway, while it is likely that in Israel physical torture has diminished to some extent in the last 20 years, that doesn't mean that it is no longer applied to many who have been detained. There are lots of well-documented cases. You can read about them on the website I mentioned. And recently, recently there have been reliable reports in Haaretz of renewed routine torture of Palestinian detainees, including minors, in Israeli prisons. As my friend Michal Peleg says in a recent article in Haaretz, every Palestinian knows what happens in room four of the Moscobia. The Moscobia, Migrash Rusim in Hebrew, the Russian compound, that's the police headquarters in Jerusalem. 
Room four is where prisoners are tortured. Um, let me quote O oh again. He says, and I believe him, he says, the psychological torture is the most extreme beyond the physical. So that's what I'm going to be talking about, the torture of the mind. I'll begin with a very simple but non-trivial example. I'm in the Jordan Valley with fellow activists climbing a hill to confront soldiers or settlers who are harassing these Palestinian shepherds. Suddenly a group of four young settlers swoop down on us. They want to talk. They say they want to understand where clearly crazed people like us are coming from. So we talk. Neither side spares the other. And toward the end of the conversation, which lasted maybe 20 minutes or so, one of the settlers, who was slightly older than the others, says, says to us, you're right. What we are doing to these people is cruel. In fact, inhuman. But if you look in the Bible, you will see that it, that it all follows logically and necessarily from God's promise to give the whole of this land to the Jews. End of quote. Actually, I thought the first part of this admission was a kind of achievement. Somewhere in this settler's mind or heart, he could feel the cruelty he was himself inflicting. But then the deeper truth came out. The truth is, he said, I'm quoting him again, the truth is that we don't want these people to be here, not on this hill, not anywhere in the Jordan Valley. In fact, really, we just want them not to be. I've heard a version of this statement from many Palestinians. For example, my friend, the poet, uh, Azam, from the village of Susia in the South Hebron Hills, he said to me recently, they won't let us build anything, mamnu. It's forbidden. No electricity. They won't even let us drink water. They don't want us to breathe the air. They are constantly after us. The pressure never lets up. That's the end of that quote. It's a simple, factual statement. It's not unusual in itself. But sometimes, if one knows these people well, especially if you can speak to them uh, in their own language, um, you can hear the whole progression, which goes something like this. A, they don't want us to be here. B, they don't want us to be, period. C, worst of all, they don't want me to be me. And here is O once more. He says, they, that means the interrogators and the torturers, they want to deprive you of your life, not your physical life, but your essence. You are not here, this is the police officer who was interrogating him, said to him, you are not here because you did something. You are here because you exist. So I want to take a moment to consider these words. Here's the psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott. He says, worse than having your heart torn out of your chest by a thousand rampaging horses is the attempt by another person to violate one's own hidden self, end of quote. So I've fortunately never been physically tortured, but like many of us, maybe all of us, I know something about that sort of psychic violation. And I think all Palestinians in the territories know about it. It's the meaning of what is perhaps the most common word in the Arabic language, zulum. Zulum means something like injustice or oppression, zulum. As in the phrase, aishin fi haya kulliyata, Zulum abzulum. We are living a life of oppression within oppression. Of course, it's not only the occupation that produces such sentences, though it's a fertile ground for them. Deep in the fiber of the language is a notion of malicious hurt, often linked to other words such as pride or honor, sharaf, or what is right, haq. Zulum happens all the time. It is almost as if one were waiting for it with an exquisite sensitivity to potential pain that radiates outward from the violated core of the person. At the heart of Zulum is an unfairness that no human creature can understand or withstand. 
It's crucial to recognize that in situations like in Israel, where zulum in the sense of psychic or spiritual violation of an entire people is the norm, passivity and silence on the part of the community that is perpetrating torture is itself a kind of violation, possibly worse, more consequential than what, happen than what happens in the torture chambers of the Moscovia. By the way, Azam, the poet I quoted earlier, uh, he was arrested at the age of 13. Again, it was one of these random things. He was on a bus, he was working in agriculture in Israel, inside the Green Line, and uh, at some roadblock, uh, the soldiers came in and they just took him out of the bus, and then they arrested him. They held him for some months, and he was tortured. I asked him about it. He said, don't ask me, I saw what I saw. He was only 13 years old. Anyway, uh, he did say he was, um, among other things, he was hung by one arm from a hook or a chain in the ceiling for an entire night and so on. I'm not going to go into that. Surprisingly, despite all this and more, Azam is not embittered. He has the poet's tragic joyfulness in life. He wants to publish a diwan of his poems. Identicide the conscious or unconscious attempt to efface the inner core of the other or others may be a crime against the individual as well as a crime against the collective body. The individual is turned into a disposable object, lacking life, time, thought, hope, personhood. But in Palestine, we find the collective variety of identicide which is readily broken down to individual suffering. That is, the effacement of one's own mind and all the cultural and linguistic pieces of that mind that allow us to be ourselves. We cannot think or feel at all without a language and a language-specific cultural world that gives us orientation in space, time, or memory. O says, when you have been tortured, tomorrow does not exist. I want to try to describe the modes of psychic torture that one encounters every day in the occupied territories. I was first exposed to one extremely prevalent variety in 1988-89 during the first Intifada when I used to work uh, one day a week at the Moked, that is the Center for the Defense of the Individual, a Moked Lahaganata Prat. Um, that's an organization which was founded then during the first Intifada by Lotze Salzberger and Yossi Schwartz, and it was something new in the Israeli public space. Uh, for me, it was a formative experience. In those days, before there were cell phones as we know them, the archetypal experience I encountered had to do with Palestinian mothers whose sons or sometimes husbands or brothers had been arrested by the army and then disappeared into the Israeli prisons. Disappeared because in nearly all cases, the family had no information whatsoever about where their loved one was or even if he was still alive. Um, in parentheses, I would like to add that in my own subjective view, the great majority of those arrests was arbitrary and without significant relation to the protests that were going on through Palestine. Recently, a senior officer in the Israeli intelligence agencies admitted publicly, he said, we have arrested thousands upon thousands, often without any reason, and almost always without any useful result. Anyway, the mother would sit in front of me. She was dressed in black. She was usually crying in extreme distress, and we would begin to call the prisons one after another until we finally, after some hours on the phone, would find the young man or boy. I don't recall a single case when we failed to find him, and that was at least some comfort. But the suffering I witnessed and felt in myself was immense. I don't know how to describe it. I think you feel it like a kind of craziness, a flooding of fear and anger and despair. Today, too, one can hear Palestinian mothers saying, the worst thing for me is that I cannot protect my children. They know that arbitrary arrest, usually in the middle of the night when soldiers invade the home, is an ever-present possibility. 
to say nothing of the danger of arbitrary killings in the villages. Hundreds of Palestinian miners are held now, as I speak, in Israeli prisons. And the police statistics show that 30 to 50 new arrests of this kind take place every week. And many miners, like hundreds of adult Palestinian prisoners, are held in what is called administrative detention, ma'atzar min hali, that is, arrest without trial, uh, supposedly preemptive in nature, without the arrested even knowing what he or she is charged with for what is, in effect, an unlimited period of time. Technically, if you're arrested like that, this administrative detention, you can be held at the discretion of the army commander who signs the order uh, for six months. But the uh, commander has the right to extend that order uh, indefinitely. And the tortuous element lies in the prisoner's utter helplessness before the law or the caprice of the state, and above all, in his not knowing how long he will have to endure this suffering. I often wonder about the children, like Azam, who find themselves in this situation of extreme terror, sometimes for years. What are we to make of Jehan Abu Romi, the mother of an 18-year-old detainee? Her son was terrified after interrogators told him that his mother had died in a car crash and that he had to sign a confession if he wanted to intend, attend her funeral. This according to a report by the Adala Justice Project. The car crash, of course, was a lie. And that kind of blackmail is, I believe, habitual. And here is O again. O said that they told him, you will never see your mother or your brothers and sisters alive again. So that's one kind of psychic torture. I want to say another word about what happens to the minors, to the children, um, for whom any confidence in the continued existence of their world, their home, their own sense of being is destroyed. That erosion of minimal trust doesn't even require arrest and physical torture. Just a month ago in the Jordan Valley, there was a case where Israeli settlers attacked one of the women shepherds who was out in the grazing fields with her flocks and with her young son, whom I happen to know. The shepherdess was brutally beaten by the settlers and thrown to the ground. Her son, maybe seven years old or so, was also wounded in his hand. But the truly terrible part for him, which he was able to express, was witnessing his mother humiliated and hurt by these violent settlers. He was crying uncontrollably when our activists reached them. I suppose I don't really need to say any more about this event. It too is not at all unusual. Palestinian children grow up seeing their parents' impotence in the face of the organized crime of the occupation. By the way, the army, which in theory should be charged with preventing that kind of settler attack, almost invariably teams up with and backs up the violent settlers. Um, by the way, it's not only Palestinians who suffer like this. Uh, Israeli peace activists are in similar danger. Um, if I had time, I would be tempted to tell you something of the experience of a close friend of mine, Guy Butavia, who was arrested on a trumped-up car uh, charge and uh, held for three weeks. And uh, he left a document, an amazing uh, document, uh, documenting the psychological torture that was inflicted upon him. I'm not going to say more about it, but Palestinians, Israeli leftists, and peace activists, it's all part of the same picture. And I have still said nothing about the demolition of houses, the expulsions, the constant threats, the ongoing state terror, the murder of innocents in the villages, the nocturnal invasions of homes, the humiliation at the roadblocks, and many other features of the occupation system. I believe, echoing something that Amiri said, I believe that psychic torture of the Palestinian civilian population is the core and indeed the raison d'etre of the occupation. We may need to distinguish between bearable and unbearable torture. Believe it or not, the sordid list I have just given you is in the category of bearable torture. People manage with great pain 
to live with it. Psychic torture aimed at the eradication of the self, whether it is the individual self or the collective cultural self with its centuries of history, its accumulation of shared experience, that kind of torture, psychic torture, belongs to the unbearable category. I think it is that kind of unbearable torture that is the root cause of terrorism. Identicide is a form of revenge. It's not limited to Israelis, obviously. But the Israeli occupation offers a particularly trenchant example. The message that may come from a soldier or a policeman or an official of the civil administration or a military judge is, you don't exist. We are going to wipe out all trace of your existence here or anywhere, and we will make you go away. Mass identicide demands a system, or we might call it a mass systemic psychosis. Um, in Ranan Alexandrovich's film, it's a really important film, The Law in These Parts, I recommend it, The Law in These Parts, senior judges in the Israeli military courts in the territories speak of their work two decades ago or more. So you have to know that the military courts have a conviction rate for Palestinians of over 99%. And that includes Palestinians who have just been randomly arrested. I think that's the majority of the cases. So no Palestinian has a chance of finding justice there. The judges invariably toe the line and follow the recommendations of the Shabak, that is the security goons, who give the judges evidence, if you can call it that, that the accused has no access to. Yet at least some of these judges appear in Ranan's film to be honest men. This is important. One of them describes how he would stay up all night before the trials, agonizing over what to do with the evidence he has been given. But one can't help but ask, why did he bother? The result was axiomatic and inevitable. If this is what constitutes conscience, who needs it? Couldn't this judge have resigned from his role in torturing the victims? Maybe he couldn't. The system overrides any such act, except in the cases of very exceptional individuals. I don't know of any judges in those courts who have taken that step. And there is never any dearth of new judges who will do as they are told. So here's the point, the essence of the matter. The occupation as a whole rests upon psychic torture of the occupied. It never stops. And one result of it is, as Amiri has said, the terrifying loneliness of the victim of torture, including psychic torture. A state of isolation almost inconceivable, yet somehow familiar to all of us. It is in facing that loneliness and overcoming it enough to act and to think to act and to think that the human virtues of courage and hope reside. These are hard-won virtues, rarest of all. Améry embodied them. Incidentally, the loneliness doesn't go away when you are released from prison. You return home to an alien existence. You cannot speak of what you have suffered, even to your family. You go to work. You exhaust yourself so you don't have to think about it. You're always tired, but you do not express sadness except through dark humor. Still, at some point, what has been buried will manifest itself, and then they will come back to get you, to torture you some more. There's another man. He's a friend of my friend O. We'll call him R, who lived in one of the camps the refugee camps, and he had an idea, a good idea. He wanted to start a library. So the soldiers came to him and they said, oh, came to him and said, oh, so you want them to read, do you? And then they killed him. We, the activists in the field, cannot do away with Palestinian loneliness. Perhaps we can slightly, tenuously ameliorate it as Améry's essay did for O. 
not much more than that. In a strange form of osmosis, we often discover something of that unthinkable aloneness in ourselves. I think it is possible to recognize and to understand this kind of spontaneous empathy that takes the form of knowing the interior of another person's mind or even of the minds of an entire people number, numbering millions. Sometimes I wonder if the torturers become who and what they are because they are unable to bear that spontaneous, partly unconscious empathy with their victims. It eats away at them and meanwhile they begin to enjoy their job. I'm almost finished. I have one last thought. Um, it'll take me a minute or two to articulate it. You've got plenty of time. Okay. Don't worry. All right. No, no, we we have a long coffee break afterwards. So okay. We we'll probably need it. Uh, so here, the last thought: We, the activists still on our feet, are cut off from nearly all other Israelis, as if we are lepers or traitors, and we cannot ever become Palestinian. I, for one, don't want to become Palestinian. Well, I have to say, occasionally I'm tempted, you can imagine. But I don't really want to become Palestinian. I'm a Jew, and I want to be a Jew. The kind of Jew my grandparents were, not the brainwashed Jews of the nation state, who in their own distorted way may also suffer a kind of self-inflicted identicide. It may sound laughable today, but all my grandparents were Rooseveltian Democrats, like all Ashkenazi Jews in America of the 1930s. And they were also heirs to the Jewish humanistic tradition, which still survives in pockets, also in Israel. I think this old and venerable Jewish tradition is fiercely antithetical to, indeed incapable of, inflicting identicide on others. So, strangely, starting with systemic psychic torture and the ongoing attempt by Israeli Jews to destroy forever not only Palestinian homes and grazing grounds and fields and bodies, but also Palestinian consciousness and selfhood, faced with that, starting with that, I find myself back at the age-old question who is a Jew, or what is a Jew? And you know what, I'm beginning to think it's not a very good question. Um, and anyway, I don't know the answer to it. Um, but I think I can perhaps tell you what a Jew is not, in my own understanding. So we have the testimony of a Tibetan monk. It's possible I learned this from Amber, I'm not sure. There was a Tibetan monk who spent years in Chinese prisons and who was repeatedly, and perhaps more or less constantly, tortured there. Um, and when he got out, he said, it got to be so bad that I was almost, almost unable to feel compassion for my torturers. So, I stand in awe at that sentence, at that sentence and at that feeling, but I don't think it fits the Jewish template. I don't think so. The Jews know a lot about unforgivable crimes and also about acts of torture, mental and physical, but not, it seems, for most of them, about the ones they are inflicting in Israel-Palestine on their Palestinian brothers and sisters. Sometimes I think that for the Jews, some hope for a better life lies in that cultural refusal to forgive the unforgivable. And I like to think that a day will come when Israelis, many of them, will recognize what we have done and maybe even seek forgiveness. That thought is the first faint glimmer of hope. And now we may wonder, what would Jean Amiri have said about the Tibetan monk's amazing statement? Thank you.
David, thank you for uh, a talk that was um, both harrowing but also moving. And um, although I follow some of what you've been doing in the territories, um, there were things that I didn't know about either. Um, I want to depart for a second from our usual procedure. Our usual procedure is not to give introductions to people um, because we don't want to take the time and we have it all printed up for you. Um, and when I said I gave David a pass because, Dave, because he's David, uh, several people who know him in the room smiled um, and understand that what I meant by that, I, since our very controversial conference, not quite three weeks ago, um, we have gotten some rather unpleasant coverage of various kinds, particularly on Twitter. And we got something from uh, one of our opponents saying, look, these horrible anti-Israel people are using jean Marie now to, uh, uh, you know, instrumentalizing Jean, jean Marie. So if you're watching or listening, you know who you are. I do want to introduce David Schulman. Um, just for a moment, we also got criticized by some people at that conference, what is an activist doing at an academic conference? In fact, the particular activist in question had a PhD um, and had published a serious book. But I do want to say to anybody with doubts, um, the Einstein Forum never does standard academic conferences. We always mix scholars, writers, artists, political, politicians and activists, that's what we do. With David Shulman, we basically have the prototype of the scholar activist. Although he's not known in Germany, uh, he has received the most distinguished prizes in most of the rest of the world for his scholarly work on India, including the Israel Prize. Um, which is the highest prize the state of Israel can give, uh, which he hesitated about accepting, uh, and then accepted it with a public video, uh, saying he was accepting it because he could give the prize money to Tayush, the Israeli Arab organization that he has been working with since the second intifada. Um, so, yeah, um, that's for those of you who want to shoot little arrows <laughs> at us after David's talk. But in fact, I think it was entirely uh, in keeping with some other things that we've already discussed in this conference. I'm particularly thinking about Moshe's discussion of the achievement and fragility of the concept of the human. And when you quoted your, um, the settlers saying that they know that this is inhumane, what they're doing, um, I see an absolutely direct connection. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about um, you know, we talked about the fact that the concept of the human is an enlightenment achievement. There was just us and them before. There was just my tribe and the other tribes. Um, and clearly, of course, what the settlers are going on is a, you know, a biblical, pre-enlightenment, uh, tribal concept of um, these, yeah. what we've known, what we've come to call human beings. I wonder if you see any place, given that they can already recognize that they're doing something humane, to bring them to a concept of the human. Um, so first of all, I have to say something before I address the question uh, directly. Um, the settlers are a heterogeneous group, and I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't generalize about all of them by any means. The ones that I tend to meet out in the field um, 
I don't know how many of them there are altogether, but perhaps there are no more than about, let us say, 30,000 or 40,000 of them. That is, these are extreme, violent settlers, most of them. Um, well, many of them, especially now, in the last year or two, um, they're sort of troubled adolescents who have been somehow absorbed within the settler project very deliberately in a calculated way. They're confused and um, they tend to be very violent and they're brainwashed also, you know. But that doesn't mean that all settlers are like that. Well, you shouldn't think like that. It's, um, you know, most of them are regular people like anybody else. They're living in settlements, usually initially for economic reasons. And uh, it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, I don't want to generalize about them, but these ones that I now meet in the field, and they are extraordinarily violent, I, um, I sometimes say things to them, uh, doesn't do any good. I might say to them something like, um, you know, these people are just like us. They're no different than us. They're human beings. They're just like us. They have the same, they want what we want. Same kinds of things, simple life, something like that. Uh, you have to understand that uh, it's not exactly a conversation. This happens in a heightened uh, moment of uh, kind of distress and violence and so on, but there are potential violence. Um, it's extremely unusual for any of them to actually uh, respond to that in any way. Once I said, sometimes uh, if you use something that touches upon their own language, their own mental world, uh, you might get a response. For example, um, uh, I once said, um, <laughs> We were out in the fields, the uh, usual thing, Palestinian village, the fields are being taken over by these settlers, they're marauding settlers that are there in the Palestinian fields every day, they're driving them crazy, they're extremely violent. So, and they attacked um, a friend of mine physically, he was beaten up, and uh, when I managed to extricate him, and I, these settlers are still there, I said to them, you know, haven't you ever heard that God said in the Bible, Thou shalt not steal. So, um, settler is taken aback for a moment. He, one of them, he, so he looks at me and he says, what do you mean? I said, you know, it's pretty simple, isn't it? I, it's pretty simple, thou shalt not steal. Look what you guys are doing. Um, and for that very reason, because you're transgressing this commandment, I said, not in exactly these words, but I said, I don't think you're going to be in this place you're living in for very long. That's what I said, I was kind of optimistic view. So he said to me, correctly, he said, um, you just pick the passages that happen to be convenient to your view. <laughs> and he's right about that, actually. He's, in a way, he's kind of right, you know, it's true. And I could give you other examples of that, but it's extremely rare to find among those, that self-selecting group, a real response. And I think that most of them feel that Palestinians do not count as people, as human beings. I think they think that they're a different category. And the reason I feel I can say that is that um, what usually comes out of them, out of their mouths, is this, this kind of stream of uh, unbear unbearably boring and repetitive curses. Once I said to one of them, you know, I said, okay, you can yell at me and curse at me, other, but I don't know how you can stand to live with this stuff going on in your head all the time. It's terrible, absolutely horrible, you know. But they're not able to see that or feel it. It's just something some, somebody like me from the outside might, might notice. I mean, some of them, I suppose, are capable of thinking that uh, the main thing is just to get these people out of there, and that's the point, but... There's a lot of them that take great delight in causing pain, physical pain. I have a follow-up question, but let me ask first, is there anyone here who has a question? This, anyone here? Um, I hope I, I get it clear in, uh, in, in a short amount of time. Um, ben Amari writes about that he tries, that's how I, it very graphically, that he tries to be Jewish, 
mm. without being it completely in his inner self, but that's the choice he sees for himself. In your um, work as an activist, both inside Israel and with Jewish communities outside Israel, um, where many, to my biggest surprise, are supportive of what is going on. At mm. least, yeah, they are supportive, I'd say. Um, for, the, for the readings I did during the last years, it sometimes came to me that there is like a shortcut, an argument, as um, we don't want to identify as victims, we want the freedom of choice. And, and I mean it as ironically as it sounds, mm -hmm. of not being the victims, but the prosecutors. So sometimes I have the very depressing feel, and does, is this an argument you meet? And, and how to deal with it? I sometimes find this very depressing, but I have the feeling that a lot of the argument around the state of Israel and why we are even supposed to turn, not to look at what is happening, as you said, on various occasions, even in Germany, the state tries us to keep from expressing what is going on mm. in a way that is actually, from my point of view, not completely in line with our, even our constitution. Um, do, do you hear an argument like this, like finally we have the choice whether we want to be the victims or the prosecutors, and now we want to be the prosecutors for once? Can I, before David answers this, um, it is not true that most of the Jewish communities outside Israel, okay, support the occupation. Okay, no, I'm just saying, uh, yeah, but you don't hear about it inside Germany very often, okay? But as a matter of fact, um, you know, the majority of Jewish communities outside of Israel, they, I mean, there, there's a whole variety of differences, but it, it, they do you not. Mainly in New York, you go to BDS meeting. I mean, I'm aware of that. Hmm. <laughs> well, even apart from BDS, there there are ranges of views. Yes, no, I'm aware but of that. That's what I mean. Don't include supporting the occupation. So, um, yeah, it's kind of hard to answer that question with any kind of authority. I'm I'm just a grassroots peace activist. I really don't know. Um, I imagine that there are many Israelis who may feel, or may feel unconsciously, something like what you articulated, namely, we're not going to be the victims anymore, let somebody else be the victims. They might feel like that, some people might. I have no idea of how one would even measure that or what it would be to think of it like that. And I think that, um, although um, politically speaking, the country has shifted very much to the right, uh, I still think, uh, even now, that more than half of the Israeli population uh, is basically somewhere uh, in the moderate center, somewhere. I mean, that's a gross simplification, but something like that. There are reasons that the country chooses right-wing governments, and sometimes extreme right-wing governments, you know. So, I mean, maybe Israelis, some Israelis feel, yeah, they don't want to be victims anymore, and they have the opportunity now to inflict pain. And they prefer that to the other, and of course there's a lot of fear of the Palestinians, justified fear. It's a complicated uh, situation, and actually I tend to think, I've said this in this very room once or twice before, I think that when one acts, in a, when one adopts an activist mode, as in the Palestinian territories, one acts not out of uh, uh, what Susan has called moral certainty, but out of uh, uncertainty, moral, moral clarity. clarity, sorry, moral clarity, but out of... Uh, I believe in certainty. <laughs> right, okay, clarity. One tends to act out of a kind of sense of uh, uh, amorphous ambiguity in which you're trying to do the best you can under very difficult and complicated uh, conditions. I think it's very important to act. One has to act because the suffering is immense and we're responsible for that part of it. But, um, yeah, I don't think I fully believe in moral clarity, actually. <laughs> Dominic. Hi. Um, I want to introduce a term that um, Amari talks about that we haven't 
addressed yet. I assume it'll come up at some point, but. Can you be louder? It looks yeah. like people in the back are straining. So um, in the, the essay on resentment or resentments, you know, he has this moral imperative that there are some wounds that are irreversible, mm -hmm. right? And they not, it's not only that they can't be healed, but they shouldn't be seen as capable of being healed. Yeah. And they kind of exist outside of the natural time and kind of remain in this moral universe as a, as a, as a, just as a, as a psychic wound. Um, and I was wondering, um, I mean, this sets him apart from uh, Primo Levi, obviously, although I just like to add that I think when it comes to forgiveness, it doesn't really make sense to speak of forgiveness unless you have someone approach you who wants to be forgiven. Yeah. I think the idea of just forgiving someone as an act without being asked for it yeah. doesn't really make sense to me. But the question I wanted to ask is um, whether for these friends of yours um, that have been tortured, if, I mean, I guess this is more of a psychological question, if there's something about maintaining this moral imperative of a wound that can't be healed that's actually n not good <laughs> for your soul because there's no way then to reintegrate with society at large, isn't it? Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, Dominique, that, that seems right to me in the sense that um, something I know in myself. I think there are such, there are unforgivable sins. And um, I myself, I can't adopt the Buddhist ethic of absolute compassion no matter what, like the Tibetan monk. I can't do it. Um, but that doesn't mean that one has to remain uh, enslaved to the resentment that comes out of the pain that has been inflicted upon you and that is unforgivable. Doesn't mean that. This friend of mine, oh, you know, uh, he carries the burden of the torture around with him. He told me, you know, and comes back in his dreams, night after night. But he's eminently capable of being with Israelis, you know, and of thinking of what peace might look like. I, I've seen it, let me put it in a, in a very concrete way. There have been quite a few occasions on which I've seen, you know, there are dialogue groups and things like that. Israelis and Palestinians might meet. Um, there are organizations that are based on creating uh, some kind of possible communication. The combatants for peace is one of them, so they routinely run these groups where Israelis who served in the army and Palestinians who served in one or the other of the um, Palestinian militant groups meet and discuss things. And, you know, I've seen cases where initially the uh, meetings are very difficult. Often, almost always, it's the case that um, these Israelis, former soldiers, never actually saw a Palestinian civilian as a civilian. They saw only an enemy to be, you know, in the, the sights of their gun or something like that. And suddenly they're faced with actually living people. And similarly for the Palestinians, same thing. They saw Israelis only as armed soldiers who were about to kill or wound. And it can go on like that for a long time, even for days, actually, in which the two sides don't know what to say to one another at all. But little by little, the nature of the pain and the hurt becomes present in the space and is articulated one way or the other. And sooner or later, there will almost always be a moment where somebody on one of the sides suddenly says, I get it, I understand it. I understand that we have hurt you. We have hurt you terribly. And I'm sorry. And then things change. It's amazing how things can change. You don't have to forgive the, you don't have to forgive the unforgivable. And that's not part of the plan. And I think it's mostly impossible for Palestinians and Israelis. I don't think it's really possible. But to be able to say, I'm sorry, that's an amazing human achievement, and I've seen it happen. You know, once there was this time, 
I was very moved by it. We were in Susia, this little village, and there was a whole busload of these combatants for peace who were down there in the Palestinian village for the first time in Palestine. Most of them had never actually been in the occupied territories unless they were there in the army as soldiers, you know. So now here, there's this big busload of these combatants for peace that are the first time in this Palestinian village, you know, and there were Palestinians also part of the same organization. They were on the bus, you know. And there were the beginnings of these conversations. So, you know, I, I was there with my group before these people arrived. So I see them arrive. I go up there and I, I overhear a conversation uh, which was very moving to me. Uh, there was a young Palestinian man and a young Palestinian woman. And they were in some kind of conversation. They obviously liked one another, you know. So the Palestinian man said to the woman, um, he said, um, can I invite you to come to my house? So for the Israeli girl, you know, this was like, I, this was way beyond what she would have thought possible at all, you know. She said, no, I don't think I can do that. Um, you know, to go into a Palestinian city or village and to be a guest at a Palestinian house, this is something totally beyond her range and all that. She said, I don't think I can do that. And about a minute later she said, you know what, I'll come. And I thought, you know, that's good, you know, and if those kinds of things can happen. That's what gives me hope sometimes, is the mere fact that such moments of change, internal change, can happen. Even though nobody's going to forget the pain. Yeah. Stephen, and then Peter. Kind of going back to the question of progress. Can you be an activist without believing that progress is possible? Without believing that progress is possible. In other words, yeah. is activism, this is really addressing Susan's question, can yeah. you have a bleak, completely bleak picture of what's probable and still be an activist? It's pretty bleak. If you're asking about my picture, it's pretty bleak. <laughs> I don't you know. Without really yeah. I have this thing about despair. I wrote an essay about it. It's in one of my books. I think there's, there's good despair and bad despair. There's good despair. If you're, you know, there's a way in which if you, who is it who says, um, Sendrao, the French poet Sendrao says, uh, in order to know despair, you have to love life. Uh, <laughs> have to really love life and, I think there is such a thing as good despair. I used to say, sometimes the activists will say it too. If we weren't feeling despair or even beyond despair, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here. We're there because of that despair. You know? So the answer is, yeah, you, I think of course you can. In fact, you have to do it. And I accept, um, embrace uh, Susan's distinction between optimism and hope. I think they're two very, very different oh, things. Yeah. Yeah. Hope is a spiritual act. And sometimes the worse things get, the more hope you feel. Um, that's an empirical fact. So you know, that doesn't mean that there are no moments where I, I might feel, gosh, I you know, can't go on doing this. And also, it's getting more and more dangerous. And I, you know, it's, I have those thoughts as well. You know, you know, um, we've known each other long enough so that I might um, <laughs> allow myself to disagree a little bit with your yeah. <laughs> answer. Um, because you've both written and talked about this question often enough. Um, the last time I remember you're answering a similar question, you said, I'm doing this for my granddaughter. I don't think I will see um, yeah. an, any real change in my lifetime, but I'm doing it for her. Now, I totally understand mm -hmm why um, the situation in Israel-Palestine, uh, you know, gets worse every day and leaves more room for despair. But frankly, the whole world these days is getting worse every day and we're all fighting despair. Um, but I, I, I liked your idea of saying you were doing this for your granddaughter. And that's, yeah. um, you know, it's not a belief in the necessity of progress, but it is the belief in the possibility of it. Right? Or have you changed your... So I used to feel, Susan, I, I used to think in the early years when I became active in the territory, I used to feel that I would live to see peace. It seemed to me not so distant, actually. I mean, you know, if you look at the, what happened in the year 2000, they were within 
some kind of almost a stone's throw of an agreement. Um, and I think that could happen, but I, don't, I no longer think that I'll live to see peace. I don't feel that. I do want my grandchildren to be proud of their grandfather if they read about me someday. I, that is certainly there. Uh, and I don't have any illusions that the little that we can do is going to make a real, real difference. I don't think so. But doing it is important. And also I know that we act uh, not so much because of the possible results. We do it because it's the right thing to do. The intrinsic value of a moral act is in the act, not so much in the results. Not that we're indifferent to good results, we're not. <laughs> no, yeah. Peter, and then James. Um, <clears throat> I think it's uh, valid in our jean Améry conference to mention the fact that in the 70s, the uh, German left tried very hard to uh, have Améry on their side against Israel. Hmm. And he refused. Yeah, I know. And perhaps you would like to say something about that. Of course, Israel today is not the Israel back then. Yeah. We don't know how Jean Améry would react to today's Israel, but I find it important in our context not to leave that unmentioned. Yeah, I know that. I, I know that Amiri refused to sign on to the program of the far left or the left in general, and that he defended Israel and that he thought it was enormously important, that there was a moral imperative uh, embedded in the mere existence of the state of Israel. He felt that. But I agree with what you said. It was a different Israel. I went to live in Israel in 1967. It was a different it was a different place. The public sphere was not a utopian space, but the public space was not poisoned by the kind of hyper-nationalist stuff that we hear today. It wasn't and, like that. Yeah. And by the way, I'm not sure, maybe you know, was Amelie in Israel? I don't know. I think he never was. I don't think he was. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Two things I just wanted, not questions, just and comments that just, you know, it's terrible how one wants to spunt. This is what you produce, is the desire to spontaneously uh, comment. Um, uh, I, I loved what, I was terribly moved by what you said. Um, just two things occurred to me. One is, just off what Dominic was saying, I, I'm not actually sure, despite Emery's um, term for Primo Levi, that he did actually uh, forgive in quite the way that Emery thought he did. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the wonderfully sly and ambiguous um, essay about Muller in uh, um, the periodic table, he comes to a conclusion that he won't actually forgive Muller and that Muller doesn't deserve it anyway. Um, but that's beside the point. I just wanted to say that the beautiful thing about um, doing something for your granddaughter um, took me back to Moshe's lecture about the human mm -hmm. and made me think that that's pretty much John, Stewart's, John Stuart Mill's definition of what he calls the religion of humanity, mm -hmm. um, leading, leaving something for future generations yeah. um, to uh, develop. Yeah. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. I want to ask a final question, if I may. Um, and it was provoked by your talking about your cherry picking your biblical quotes, yeah. which of course we all do. Um, and um, I, um, I recently wrote to our Rebbe, um, David and I actually met because we have the same rabbi. Um, he was here. <laughs> yes, yes, he's also been here. Um, I wrote to him saying, you know, contradictions between universalism and tribalism in the Bible, which, of which there are many. I mean, you know, on the one hand, it's you were strangers, take care of the stranger. On the other hand, it's remember Amalek. I mean, you know, it's, it's yeah. famished. Um, and I said, you know, does biblical criticism help us here? Um, you know, could we say that all of the tribalist uh, passages were written by 
J or X or Y and uh, you know the universalist passages by others. And Jim wrote back and said, um, Susan, uh, the Jewish people have been having a civil war about this since for time in, uh, in existence. And I wonder if you could comment on that um, and whether you think that's, I mean, we have these just two inextricably or inextricable um, strains, the one giving us a concept of the human and the other taking it back and talking about tribes. So really this is a question for Moshe, who's more immersed in the sources than I am, I guess, but um, not I guess, I'm sure. Um, see, I guess I grew up with an illusion. Uh, my mother taught us children that she said, um, being Jewish, what does it mean? She was very much into her Jewishness. That was the central part of her life. Um, so she said, what does it mean? She said, we were slaves. Once we were slaves in Egypt, and because of that, we will never, but truly never, enslave another person or stand on the side of the oppressor, never. So I thought, okay, that's what being Jews, being Jewish was all about. I grew up the same way in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> this is what being Jewish meant. Probably it's some enlightenment period illusion. I don't really know. And the one way to cure that illusion is to go to live in Israel. But on the other hand, uh, I still tend to think that not every word in the Bible is of on the same level or status as any other word. There are some core things that really, at least for me, have greater weight. And um, so on that level, it's easy for me to like cherry pick, as you said, and I pick the ones that I, that I like. It's a problem because the proof texts that our opponents have to use are also there in the text. Right, There's that's no, right. No question they are. about that. Yeah, yeah. 